Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today with Product School. Today, we're going to chat with you all about onboarding strategies to help you drive growth. And so if you're not familiar with onboarding strategies, uh, by the end of today's call, you absolutely will be. And so as part of this session, we're going to help you understand how you can get a better really understanding of your audiences across different channels and your audience's journey so that you can successfully onboard your, your clientele. We will walk you through some case studies of some of our own customers on how they've done this and some of the techniques and best practices they're using. We'll also share with you how AI and automation can make your job a little bit easier and also give you some better data and insights to be able to guide your onboarding journeys. And lastly, we'll talk to you about how to scale your onboarding strategy for retention, but also as your user base grows. And to give you a quick intro to me, my name is Megan and I head up the marketing at Mo Engage. And I'm joined to you by my colleague, Vasil, who manages our strategy. And so with that, I will pass it over to Vasil and he will kick off the presentation today. Thank you, Megan, really appreciate it. Um, hello, everyone. So just a very high level overview of who Mo Engage. Um, Mo Engage is a smart um, engagement platform. Uh, we use insights to really understand the user journey of customers. Um, and we help over 1,200 customers and brands around the world. Uh, we do some massive amount of engagement on a daily basis. As you can see, we have uh, customers all through the globe. Uh, we have offices um, as well in, I think, now 11 countries or something like that, and a whole bunch of more partners. So. Um, we, we help uh, startups as well as big, uh, large enterprise unicorns uh, have meaningful relationship with their customers. So maybe we can kind of go into the next slide. There you go, our offices. <laughs> so um, what we are trying to do is really use insight engagement um, insights to understand and what is happening with a customer in their user journey. So everything, um, all the data that we collect help us um, guide our customers how they engage with their users. So everything from onboarding, engagement, optimization to growth. And you can do this when you have the right data and when you have the right strategy. So let's talk about onboarding uh, a little bit more and why is this so important to, should be so important to you and it's so important in today's world. 74% of potential customers uh, switch to other applications uh, in onboarding process if uh, it's not right. Um, so no user uh, like a complicated uh, onboarding process. So if you have too many fields, uh, if you don't have the right integrations to switch to quickly uh, onboard them uh, in the app, uh, if there is uh, email that somebody needs to uh, click on to confirm and they never get it. Uh, all of this is part of onboarding. And the onboarding is so important today because you, you, you're spending a lot of money on acquisition, and the first thing that you need to do is to activate and onboard a customer. So this is why um, it is, you know, very, this is probably the most important step of a user journey in the end of the day. Next. So, in today's world, uh, and I put some statistics here from uh, Gartner, for example, um, everything is going up. The cost of gas, the cost of food, um, the cost of uh, technology. And as, as all of this is happening, you need to be able to understand better uh, how to manage this cost. And if you can, uh, really manage the onboarding better, then you know you, all the money that you've invested in acquisition are not going to go away. 
So what this is here uh, talking about is, um, you know, for example, Gartner asked a lot of marketers, um, you know, what do they believe is going to be a big impact on their uh, markets uh, and on their operations? And 75%, for example, said that they believe the increased costs would have a negative impact on their business. Um, we're seeing that we're going into a recession. Um, and this is why in today's world, it's going to be so mo more important that you take onboarding activation so seriously. Um, because this customers that you're trying to get also, you don't want to lose them at the first point of engagement. Uh, you really want to get them from day one and give them show them value, make sure that they see how easy it is to get on your platform uh, and, and take care of them. Next slide. So let's go through kind of what is the onboarding process, you know, what really is going on there, right? Uh, to understand um, the onboarding and to really optimize it, um, you need to take uh, a lot of data. Now, in you know, we take data that is coming from email, from the web browser, from CDPs, from surveys, uh, from the apps, from your TV, uh, all this user uh, properties, behavior data, and everything else goes into uh, a, a basically a user profile. We create this view of the customer that is 360 view of the customer. Sometimes uh, some people call it single view of the customer to really understand at the beginning, where is this com uh, customer coming from? What do they like? Who are they? Once you know this, you can then better carve and create that user journey, which starts with the onboarding process. Next slide. So this is what a sample user profile kind of collects, um, you know, and, and, you know, has its site, right? We know who that person is. We know whether they're male, female, um, when they became a customer, um, how are they using the system? If there is some loyalty level, what kind of loyal, how loyal is that customer? Uh, Sarah, in this case, uh, what is the LTV customer, right? A lot of KPIs are very important. So the more data you collect, it's not just to use the data, but to really convert this data into insights. And when you convert this to insights, you can then better understand how to help a customer. Is this uh, customer uh, a happy customer? Is this customer not happy and potentially, you know, uh, or a returning customer? And, and so based on this, you can kind of figure out what um, offers you want to give them, what user journey, how do you want to uh, kind of uh, move, uh, move the user journey of that user throughout. Uh, maybe uh, you want to make it easier or you want to get more information. So by understanding the user, uh, by understanding where they're coming from, how they're using the system, what actions are they taking inside, how long are they staying in the app or they're not staying on the app, where they came from and all that, you can then really uh, start generating a better user experience. Next. So, uh, yeah. So let, let me give you here a specific example. Uh, Audio Mac is one of our customers. And for them, the onboarding is the most important part. We, we've had a number of conversations with them. Um, and so what they want to do is make it as easy as possible. Once you log in, um, be able to find the music that you like and to be able to start listening to it very, very simply and very, very, uh, very uh, quick. So understanding what kind of music you like and then having maybe pre-built uh, playlist of that specific music is going to really help these customers uh, have a great experience. There's so many options out there today, guys, uh, as you know, for music apps, for all kinds of apps. So um, any 
brand needs to take the first and most important part of in of onboarding. So important. So when you can understand if somebody's coming from a rap website or heavy metal website, you can then really tailor the journey and have, you know, uh, the type of music that they're going to listen to uh, ex- exposed to them right away, rather than, you know, have a very generic user journey. So again, understanding the user, understanding what that really means, what are those insights is going to help you to convert those users quickly into a paying customer as well. So let's look at a sample uh, flow of onboarding journey, right? So somebody has found the app and they're installing it. What that means is that they already, you know, uh, were advertised or they found it one way or another, they installed the app. After a day, if there is nothing really going on, um, you can send them push notifications uh, if they have already opted for this, right? Of who are the trending artists? Maybe we know already a little bit about them, uh, where they came from. Maybe they indicated what type of music they like, uh, or they clicked on a couple of uh, songs so you can kind of understand, hey, they like opera or they like rap or something else. And so based on this, you want to quickly engage them. The next day, you wait one more day, and then you send them what are the top songs um, via push notifications. Uh, You wait a few more days, and then uh, you send uh, another push notification uh, to a global level. Uh, You wait a few more days, and then uh, you send notification around supporters. So supporter uh, push is a very interesting option between uh, AudioMac, which allows you to kind of support other uh, artists. And so they're creating not just an app for listening experience, but a community. So again, if you understand why people go to one app, and they have a very kind of different purposes. Some just kind of want to enjoy uh, some user experience. Some want to contribute. Others want to support a bigger community and engage with others. This is a great way to, again, in this case, engage your customers, uh, engage your users. And you don't want to do too many of those notifications the same day uh, or wait uh, too long. So. You, you can, the, the other very important part of this is this gets optimized through testing. So uh, for maybe this not going to be a very good example for every app out there, but you need to test and figure out depending on the users, depending on the content, depending on the vertical, uh, test different things. Am I going to wait a day? Am I going to wait three days? Uh, is this person still engaging? Um, maybe you don't need to do some of those things and you can bypass some of those steps. So um, again, use different channels. Uh, think about understanding the better the user. Uh, and for AudioMac, this is one of the, the user journeys that really work uh, great for them for onboarding. Next slide. So uh, AudioMac, uh, did that specific, for example, uh, uh, journey. And this is what they got. They really uh, had uh, some lift in their conversion rate. So 8.4% increase, it's pretty good, uh, you know, results and KPI. Uh, you know, in week one, they were getting only 4%. In week two, they got uh, 5.1%, week three, 55 and so on and so on. So during this whole thing, uh, session per user also increased almost 18%. And these numbers, uh, if you're engaging with the user and you have 18% uh, increase, that means that you're doing something right. Maybe you can do much better in your uh, engagement, but 18% is not bad at all. Uh, and the premium trial started converting at 18% as well, uh, increase. So um, again, test different things. Uh, you always have to test, have a hypothesis, 
in and trying new things uh, all the time. In this case, for AudioMag, that worked very, very well. Next slide. So, um, what are the the factors here that you know uh, influence the quality of of this engagement? Um, you know, we talk about to 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 product people versus marketing people. The conversation was so different, um, but product design seems to be one of the most important things, uh, and ease of use. So if you have an app um, and, and kind of like look at where the buttons and you have a phone, uh, for example, are the buttons down in the bottom where it's easy for you to access, especially on these bigger phones nowadays, or do you have buttons that are in the bottom, then you have some buttons on the top. And I can give you a lot of examples for bad design where even me with my big hands, I have hard time you know, uh, switching between different options of an app or trying to find where is this and where is that. So um, optimizing the user experience of the design and the app, uh, whether this is on a mobile, whether this is on a website, is one of the most important things. Again, how do you find this out? You look at insights, you look at the user journey. If you are seeing that users are dropping off uh, especially during the onboarding process. You need to understand why. You need to um, look at deeper into the data and see where is that drop-off happening? What type of users there is a drop-off? Is it with a specific operating system? Is it with a specific device? Is it with a, uh, whether you're looking on the web versus on the mobile? Um, and, and so on and so on. Uh, but ease of use uh, and simplicity is what makes, uh, you know, what, is, what, keep, what, what keeps coming back as the key ingredient to success. Um, then you need to kind of look at, um, uh, for example, uh, let me look at here some numbers. For example, um, if you look at the different type of, uh, apps and, and verticals that you can be doing this, right? Uh, what kind of numbers you're going to get for this, whether this is for business and finance, utilities, or educational. As you can see here on this slide, we have different numbers um, that are likely representing different KPIs um, about which apps are getting more, uh, you know, better engagement versus others. But the type of channel here that influence the use, you know, is it the lifestyle, is it utility? Again, all of this really matters and also different types. Right now, I bet you there is a lot of apps that are uh, interesting uh, to users around finance. And in this economic times, how do I save money? Um, you know, what do I do because I'm most stressed out uh, with, with my work? And uh, mental apps have been going through the roof, especially during COVID. So uh, it, it depends on message, it depends on the vertical, it depends on a lot of things like that. Messaging strategy, that's another very big one. Um, you know, from how often do you engage somebody? Uh, are you bombarding them with messages? Uh, on different channels, trying to get somebody to click and figure out which channel they want to be. Uh, is it too much? Is it one a day, one a week? Uh, is it five a week? Uh, you can overdo it. Um, you know, and, and also what is uh, important to a specific user? Um, if you can figure out what's important to one user versus another, and you send them information, they're either going to ignore it, it's going to go into spam, they're going to flag it to the spam, and that's not going to help you. Um, here about speed of innovation, this is an interesting one um, in, in updates. There are pluses and minuses when it comes to innovation, you know, whether you have an app or a website. Um, if you look at Meta and Facebook, they're constantly making changes to their to to their app 
uh, Instagram. They just change and start testing uh, the app without, for example, a shopping button. Uh, sometimes you can do this easily if you're doing just some kind of a mobile testing, but sometimes people go and, and load a new app, a new app, and then you have to download it, and then things break, and so it gets very complicated. So you have to think about what are the benefits versus the uh, you know the the impact of having different uh, changes that you can do uh, on on the site uh, on your mobile app and stuff. And do you want to do just some testing, or do you want to do full-blown change and update to your website with new features and new things. Try to do mobile testing. Try to do website testing for a specific segment of your users and analyze that data for the user journey. Um, let's go to the next. So um, Empiricus is another uh, happy customer of ours. Um, they're a super app um, for the stock market. They're like a community uh, of sort as well in Brazil. They have almost half a million subscribers. Um, and uh, they have lots of good content uh, that brings people going back to it all the time. Now, what they did is they were using, for example, again, a user journey analytics and insights to understand what is happening with their customers. Where is the drop-off? Uh, once you installed an app, what is going on, uh, what works, what doesn't, and how long does it take for a user to go from installation to subscription um, in a user journey. And then they started doing a lot of testing and um, that really helped them uh, optimize the user journey experience specifically at the onboarding activation point. Next slide. So this is uh, uh, like a very specific uh, example with uh, kind of their user uh, journey graph. Um, and so they, they looked at what is the problem? Uh, you know, you, you create a hypothesis and you see uh, the onboarding funnel is too narrow, right? And hers the engagement, retention, the onboarding and everything else. So the idea here was to change the flow so the user directly um, has contact with, with the right content. Again, how do you do this? You need to understand a little bit better the user. Um, and then you want to put that information to them faster. Uh, you know, when you don't want to have you know, five clicks, whether it's on a website or on a mobile, to try to find the right content. And many times, even if you search it, and how is that being displayed, and so on and so on. So by understanding the flows and trying to shorten the steps and the time it takes uh, for a person once they install and get on the site to finding the content, they were able to reduce the drop-off by 45%. Um, they changed a whole bunch of things. And for example, the content engagement increased over 100%. Uh, the app sessions increased by 20%, which means that people stayed longer on the app uh, and on the website uh, to, to read content because it was easiest to find, easier to find it and it was giving them value right away. So 45% is really good. Now, how do you scale the onboarding strategy um, you know, for one customer to millions? And, and you know, that's not an easy one. We about user personalization and uh, how do you do this at scale, right? Um, how do you uh, do this is, again, you use the, the, the system to do it for you. Hopefully you have the right system uh, in place. Um, that allows you to automate processes uh, for each user or type of user, right? So automatically, for example, uh, you know, figure out what is the best time to engage? What is the best channel to engage? What is the best message and on the best device for specific user? The system can 
automatically figure this one out for the user. Um, this really is the best moment in the user journey at the end of the day. Um, you know, th there isn't really a best time. It's where is in the in in the in the time of the journey, in the moment of the journey. Uh, somebody, for example, is looking for a loan, um, and you know that because they're searching through different websites, and you know maybe the best channel for them is going to be SMS because they reply right away or they didn't put stop in it. So figure out what is happening out there. Be aware of what are the, the external uh, forces that are happening. Interest rates are going up. Uh, there is recession. People really want to kind of jump in and close that loan. Uh, figure and, and use this in your journey. So you can't just build a journey and just leave it. You need to have multiple journeys, test which one works for the what type of user and use the data to better uh, figure this one out. And then the system can automatically do this for you and all your customers based on the, the segmentation that they have. Next Thanks, slide. Vasco. And I was just gonna add something on when it comes to the different tools. So obviously AI can be really helpful when you're trying to scale, right? And so yep. there are several other tools out there. And in this one in particular, uh, we call RFM analysis and it stands for recency, frequency, and monetary. And as a product manager, you want to create the ultimate experience for your customers. You want to make sure that you're offering them absolutely the experience that's meaningful, right? Um, and so when it comes but to... It, uh, go ahead, Vasco. No, no, I was just going to say... It, it, with it, whichever tool you're using, whichever uh, tool for analyzing you're using, the most important thing, though, is going to be having good data. Make sure that you have uh, good, uh, hopefully, first-party data because it's a junk in, junk out. If you don't have good data, your analysis with whatever advanced AI or RFN tool you're going to have are not going to be as accurate. Sorry, Megan. <laughs> no, no, it's it's so true, and that goes back to what Vasil, you had mentioned earlier around being able to make sure you're integrating data from different sources and you're creating that unified profile. And when it comes to tools like this, this is a way for you to easily dynamically segment your customer base so you can understand, okay, which of my users are the most loyal, who are repeat buyers of us, or who are hibernating users. I, I always try to think about the retail example because I'm someone who generally shops around Black Friday with certain brands, but I don't shop the rest of the time of the year. So I would be considered a hibernating customer. So how can you create an experience that's very relevant for me, but also that's separate from maybe your loyal customers where you're thinking about, okay, what kind of loyalty programs can I offer? Or what kind of um, content or products matter most to them? And so using a tool like this will help you scale and how does it work? Why does it work? It's really because you're able to quickly identify who are your champion users? Who are the users who are most promising, the ones that maybe have some potential? You might also see some that are at risk. So maybe you've seen a customer hasn't bought from you recently and they were prior a loyal customer. Or maybe you've seen that a customer has recently uninstalled a mobile app that you're using to engage with them. Those are all signals that as a product manager, you're able to pick up on so that you can try to change that path of the user and still offer them the most relevant experience. And when it comes to understanding what that profitable path is, we talked a little bit about user path analysis earlier. This is kind of breaking down what does a typical journey look like for your customers. And as you know, you have a lot of different customers. You have your at-risk customers, your loyal customers, you have your uh, hibernating customers and so forth. And everyone may be on their own path. And so when you're thinking about how do I create that user journey and how do I create that flow, just know that decisions can be made with intelligence and AI so that you can create and predict what that next path looks like. Because you may go into it thinking, okay, I think all of my users are going to follow one path, but that may not be the case at all. You want to make sure that you're looking for what a path of reality would look like for each individual. And I want to just talk to you a little bit about how AI helps here. We're going to walk through another customer example. Um, but really, AI is meant to tell you what is the best channel for each individual at the right time. So you may have someone that you're onboarding that could be maybe a premium user 
and they would essentially fall into a different path than someone who could just be, you know, a one-time purchaser. And so AI will tell you which of those journey segments are driving those key metrics. And you can leverage control groups to understand um, what's the best path at that right time and trying to let the machine figure out that journey for your customers based on previous behaviors or based on their preferences. Going back to what Vasco said about the data, making sure that it's based off of data so that you're not making those guesses, but you're able to actually follow reality based off of what those conversion points look like. And so when you think about Intelligent Path Optimizer, this is a product that um, we have here, and we'll walk you through an example of how you can make this real. But it's really about allowing you to experiment because when you are starting to collect data on your users, you may not have all of the answers, right? You need to build off of previous data. You need to build off of previous actions that users are taking. And so what our Intelligent Path Optimizer does is allow you to have some A-B and multivariate testing so that you can essentially optimize paths in real time, whether you're starting to see a trend that maybe path A outperforms path C or path C outperforms path B and path A, it will be able to optimize that journey for similar behaviors or similar profiles. And so when you're thinking about scale, this is, I think, the um, answer is how can I scale a unique path for each individual? And it really comes down to that dynamic segmentation, that dynamic journey building in the moment. And so I'll walk you through an example with ChipJab. And so ChipJab, you may be familiar with, if you aren't, it is a media and entertainment company. They uh, specialize in customized, personalized videos for almost any kind of holiday or event. So whether you have a birthday or you have um, Hanukkah or Christmas, or maybe it's just an everyday video, you can personalize your face within those videos. And so for JibJab, personalization is extremely important because that's the epitome of what their business is. But they were really looking at a customer journey strategy that helped them get more engagement, but also increase their subscriptions. So fun fact with JibJab, they do absolutely no advertising to make revenue. Their revenue is driven specifically off of premium users. So you can start with a free account. They have some basic free videos, but their hope is to monetize those users so that they can become premium and have access to that premium content. And so what did they do? So they did a couple things. And we'll walk through each of these on the next slide. Being able to identify a customer journey path. They built and experimented with multiple customer journeys and then creating a lasting impression with personalized notifications. And you can just see some of the results. So they had an uplift in conversion as well as a click-through rate with personalization. So understanding customer with user path analysis. So we talked a little bit about this already with Empiricus, but this is what a flow looks like for JibJab. So if you're using their mobile app, um, you also can, of course, consume content on the website. But this is just one journey for their app. And they wanted to essentially understand where do their users go before dropping off. And so um, the first is that the app is opened and they may share a video or a GIF. Then they may decide to do another video or a GIF. And then the last um, touch point is yet another video content or drop off. And finally, it's to engaging with alternative content and then dropping off altogether. So there are multiple drop off points throughout this journey. And that was allowing them to essentially use that data to craft what does a typical customer journey look like and how can I foster that engagement before they think about dropping off. And so they built and experimented with multiple customer journey paths. And so this is just an example of the different kinds of paths. And using our Intelligent Path Optimizer, they were able to identify that path B was the most successful path in being able to prevent that drop off. And lastly, what they did in terms of onboarding was really focusing on that personalization component, because as I mentioned, personalized videos, that's the heart of their business. But if they're not offering content that's also personalized throughout that onboarding journey, they may be less likely to engage those users and retain them over time. And so they really focused it on what are the personalized welcome messages that they could offer to their customers, leveraging tools like push notifications to get them coming back to the tool or sharing new videos that they're promoting and making sure that customers are alerted of those videos as long as they are relevant to what that profile is. 
And so you can just see some examples to the right of what some of those push notifications look like, as well as some of that relevant content, maybe based on previous videos they've consumed with. And so some of the results, they saw a 26% increase in click-through rate, as we mentioned, and a 1.5 times conversion, but they also got an 82% increase in click-through rate. And going back to that AI capability, they were really leveraging the best time to consent component because um, they want to make sure that they're sending these notifications and relevant content at the time that their users are engaging. And this was one of the areas where they were able to see the most lift by being able to offer the right path to the right person at that right time. And that is all we have today. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for joining us and, and listening to some of these um, strategies and best practices we shared. Hopefully there's something you can take away to inform your own strategy. I also wanted to share that we will offer attendees a exclusive free limited trial of MoEngage. Uh, that way you can try to test out some of these features yourself and hopefully see some initial boosts of improvement areas in your own onboarding experience. Um, we have our emails listed here. We definitely want to hear from you. If you have a question, if you want additional insights or best practices, just send us an email. We would love to, to meet you and learn more and answer any questions you might have in the future. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.